Good evening, everyone. Um, my name is John Frank, and I lead Microsoft's Government Affairs Program in Europe. And it's a pleasure to welcome you here today, and thank you for coming inside on such a beautiful evening. Um, the, uh, the topic tonight is digital skills, and it's a, an incredibly fascinating topic and, and one that we care deeply about. You know, Microsoft, our, we began our, our company with this vision of a, desktop, a computer on every desktop in every home. Uh, and to some extent, that's, that's been achieved. But in fact, there is a digital divide today. And when we look at broadband internet access, it does correlate with employment rates and with income. And we look at parts of Europe that have high unemployment, youth unemployment rates. Uh, there are also areas where we don't have broadband internet access. So the digital divide is, is both a physical as well as a digital issue. And our economy is going through an incredible transformation as are our social lives because of digital media. And, and it will continue to change our lives in, in small and large ways uh, for, for many years to come. And so digital skills become, as, you know, should need to become an essential part of everybody's life. Uh, for our economy to succeed, we need, we need people to have lifelong learning. Uh, so we need to be thinking about how do we introduce digital skills to young people? How do we get the very high talented artificial data scientists? But also how do we get people retrained whose jobs are affected by those artificial intelligence advances? Uh, and, and so throughout the cycle, I'd say, we need all of the above. Um, these kind of sessions, I do think, can change people's lives. And, and I just want to just be the proud father. I mentioned before to our speakers that my daughter, uh, Meryl, is graduating from university this weekend as a computer science major. Uh, now, she didn't go to a high school that had a computer science program, even though it was just a few miles from Microsoft's main campus in, in near Seattle, Washington. But I came home from one of these programs where we talked about Hour of Code, uh, which is it's an online program where we encourage people to go try computer coding for an hour. Now, my daughter Meryl tried it and said, you know, I'm pretty good at this. And so she did a second hour. And then when she got to university, she decided to take the computer science class. And my son, who's also in university at the same time, took it with her. And he dropped out after two classes. He said, this isn't for me. But, but Mariel continued and is graduating um, with a computer science degree. And so you know, the programs of trying to encourage people who never thought they'd go into computer science um, and encouraging people who, who won't be going to computer science but, but need some digital skills to succeed. And, and the encouraging companies to continue to invest in their employees over the course of, of their lifetimes so they can learn new skills uh, are all important parts of, of uh, the solution for the future. So this evening, we continue our presidency debates um, where we partner with Euractiv and with support from the Bulgarian presidency. Uh, and this is the second debate in a series of three tackling digital issues that are being addressed during the Bulgarian presidency. Uh, the third will be on um, e-evidence uh, in a few weeks. Um, and I'd like to thank our guests today uh, for, for being with us and for, for sharing your thoughts and perspectives um, with the group. Um, and with that, I'm going to turn it over to Brian for the session. Thank you so much, John. Hi, I'm Brian. I'm going to be leading the, the panel today. Just before we begin, uh, let's do some housekeeping. So uh, we have the panel discussion, then we'll have a Q&A as part of this afterwards, and then the networking uh, to follow, where you'll be invited for, uh, to join us for a drink just outside. Please switch off your phones, uh, to silent at least. And uh, if you want to tweet, use the hashtag uh, EADebates and uh, we will try and retweet as much of that as possible uh, for you as well. We have a social media team here from Euractive. The agenda, the first part of the program will be a moderated debate. The panelists today, I'm just going to introduce them very briefly, then they will introduce themselves for 60 seconds each. Uh, we're still waiting on one uh, from the parliament who's on his way. 
And uh, let's begin with uh, Yasem Girov, uh, Chair of the Education Committee at the Bulgarian Presidency of the Council of the EU, and Nuska Ferrari from the Unit for Innovation and EIT at the European Commission. Welcome. Uh, then we have Thomas uh, Jorgensen, uh, Senior Policy Coordinator from the European University Association, uh, Alice Stolmeyer, a Founder and Director of At Stolmeyer EU Digital Advocacy and also of uh, Defending Democracy. And uh, we also have Mikkel Barsland, a Research Fellow at the Centre for European Policy Studies. He's promised to be our contrarian economist this evening. And uh, missing in action, but on his way, according to his assistant at least, is, uh, will be Brando Benefe, a Social Democrat Italian member of the European Parliament. So let's uh, start with your 60 seconds, Jason. So my name is Jasen, and I got the exciting task the last <laughs> four months of chairing the Education Committee of the Council. I believe that through inclusive and quality education, we can fully reap the benefits of the digital transformation. That was very efficient. <laughs> <laughs> Anuska. So, uh, my name is Anuska. I work uh, at the European Commission in the Directorate of uh, uh, Education and Culture. And the Commission in general launched uh, the Digital Education Action Plan. We'll provide 11 action to, to boost uh, digital transformation in education and support member states. And I'm here because I think that digital skills nowadays are as important as being able to read and write. Thank you. Thomas. Yeah, I'm Thomas Jorgensen from the European University Association. So we have uh, the whole sector about 840 universities across Europe, all the way to Vladivostok, so everything you can call, you can call Europe. And we're obviously interested in everything that has with skills. That's, of course, core business for us. But, and I think I'm going to stick much to that in tonight, is about the, the, the skills and the innovation side, so, so the high end, not what do we do with jobs that disappear, but how do we prepare the innovators and experts for, for tomorrow in, in the right way. So that's Thanks. what I'm going to do. Alice. I'm Alice, and um, this, for me, is a fascinating topic because of three things. One is my background in social studies of science and technology, uh, which looks at how new technologies change society, and also vice versa. The second role is as founder and director of Stolmeyer EU uh, Digital Advocacy, and uh, so the question is, how can you do digital EU public affairs? And third, but not least, is as founder and director of Defending Democracy, which is striving for a stronger response, uh, stronger transatlantic response to the Kremlin's hybrid threats to democracy, in which digital is, plays a key role. Thank you, Alice. Michael. I'm Michael Baslund from SEPS, a think tank here in Brussels. Uh, I'm leading the Aging Societies program in, in SEP, so I come from a slightly different angle than, than many of the other panelists because uh, I'm, I'm more interested in a long-term trend relating to artificial intelligence and, and the future of work and, and ex especially how it relates and interacts with, with the aging societies trends that we see. Um, so that's, that's where I come from. I, I was at a conference last week where, where the big concern was, was labor supply and I think on this panel tonight, the, the concern might be more uh, how much labor demand there will be in the future. So, so I, I would be interested in exploring this angle. Thank you. This is called the presidency, you may have noticed. What have you been doing for the last four months? What have been your, your big themes for the digital side? Well, first of all, I must say we were very busy. And uh, for the next two months, I think uh, this will continue to be the case. Um, actually, uh, one of the four, f f we had four horizontal priorities when we started, and in two of them, education is leading. So one of them is young people, and the other one is economic society and skills. So basically, we had a very important task, and already last year, when we announced our priorities, we asked for a very ambitious plan uh, for digital education on European level. And thanks to the Commission, actually already in January, we, we got the education plan and we analyzed it in details in the Education Committee of, of the Council. Um, and not much later, we, we started working on Council conclusions on um, the, the moving towards the European education area. So this was a new idea, I mean, not so new, but a, re a reborn idea that uh, came out of the discussions that were held in Gothenburg last December and were um, uh, on which actually was the first uh, European leaders meeting that was discussing education after 10 years or more. 
So uh, now we have uh, these new ideas, this new something to work on, and actually digital is one of the main pillars. And next week, uh, the Ministerial Council taking place in Brussels on Tuesday, we will actually adopt those uh, conclusions, the first conclusions on the European education area. Uh, and uh, in addition to this, we also managed to finalize the Council recommendation on the key competencies for lifelong learning. And one of the eight uh, key competencies is actually digital. And uh, it's really good to have this uh, very concrete uh, framework that has been existing since 2006, but now has been updated to, to, the, to, um, to actually reflect the digital reality. And because uh, usually, you know, in Brussels, in many events, in many different forums, you hear people talking about digital skills, but never going into the details explaining what exactly are those skills so in the key competencies framework you can really take a look and see what what those skills are and uh, it's also the the new thing about this recommendation is actually that it also for the first time provides uh, the good practices that member states can use to take upon all, all, the, all this framework and uh, not uh, last but not least, our biggest conference uh, during the presidency was dedicated to digital education and skills. It was called Educate to Create, from digital consumers to digital creators. So we really see this as a mission, turning consumers into creators. It's in Sofia two weeks ago? It was in Sofia a few weeks ago. We had uh, quite uh, good participation and quite high level. And uh, we had uh, the Commissioner for Education as well and the, uh, the Bulgarian Commissioner for Digital Economy and Society. And actually yesterday, our Prime Minister at, one, an, at another event mentioned the importance of digital skills. So for us, this uh, really means a lot. And I believe in, in Europe in general, having more of European leaders and politicians talking about digital and digital education and mostly understanding the topic is quite key. Okay, thank you. Anuska, in terms of art, the artificial intelligence revolution, is Europe ready to capitalize on this? Uh, well, um, I'm sure that Europe will be ready to capitalize on artificial intelligence when it will hit the ground and, uh, and have an impact on everyday life. Um, now, there are different discourses, of course. One is the industry being ready for artificial intelligence, which is probably the part where we are more advanced, we could say. The other part is, of course, education. And uh, uh, wh where I come from is, of course, the world of education. And I think that there are two main aspects when you think about artificial intelligence or other developments in the digital transformation uh, world. Uh, so there are two main ele elements that affect education. One is uh, the, the basic skills of every citizen, and the other is specialized skills. And I think this covers the whole full spectrum of, uh, of digital skills and competencies. So one thing is being able to um, program devices or having l highly specialized skills in the computing, for instance. And the other thing is being on the user side or on the citizen side and needing uh, to have to deal uh, with, uh, with digital development and digital transformation. Both are needed and I think, to be honest with you, member states are doing good progress in uh, transforming education as well, in providing all young people with uh, the digital skills that are needed, especially uh, formal education, primary and secondary. So for instance, just to give you an example, uh, we, we hear a lot uh, about coding and programming and how important this is. Uh, in the introduction, you were talking about uh, the hour of code. Uh, in Europe, we have, uh, we have uh, Code Week uh, that is generally taking place in October, which is an initiative that is a grassroots initiative that is supported by the Commission, uh, where we invite uh, people to try out uh, coding, not just in education, but also uh, outside the education and lifelong learning perspective. So we all hear about, uh, about coding, and I have to say that because of this, uh, this wave probably, uh, many ministries of education all around Europe were really inspired in changing their curricula. So we had, for instance, in 2014, the UK, England, who, which was pioneering a new curricula on coding uh, from primary to secondary education. And if you think, you know, 2014 is not uh, a long time ago. Now there are at least 15 member states who introduced either coding or algorithmic thinking or computational thinking in their curriculum or are about to do so. So I think this is 
some positive example, I would say, on the basic skills spectrum. The, the, the European Union doesn't have direct competence over education, so how do you incentivize member states to really move quickly? Uh, well, we don't incentivize member states to move quickly. We, <laughs> we support them in moving forward, and uh, uh, there are several ways of doing so. Um, well, first of all, in all respect of subsidiarity, because they need to take the choice, so if they don't want to move, they will not move, of course. Uh, second, uh, we have this open method of coordination. So uh, we have, for instance, a working group on the digital skills and competencies that uh, we are managing uh, at DG Education and Culture, uh, where ministries of education and other educational stakeholders uh, like uh, NGOs or other uh, representatives uh, get together and, uh, and they discuss and work together on um, pushing forward education. So there are six uh, working groups on education and um, Thursday and Friday this week there will be actually be a very big conference uh, that is organized as uh, you know, the closing up of the mandate of uh, the working group on uh, schools, for instance. So that's, that's one. The other, of course, is the exchange of best practices, okay. uh, which, is, which is also very important. And I think that, for instance, this wave of you know, uh, curricular reform I was talking about uh, was also um, happening uh, like a snowball effect. Uh, there was, for instance, Finland, who was explicitly saying that they took the example of the UK and France did the same and so on and so forth. So this is another example. And then the things that we do are, for instance, so, uh, yes, and you were mentioning, for instance, uh, the key competencies for lifelong learning. So this is about um, a framework um, that sets out what the competencies are. So this is a recommendation that came out in 2006. And I think it was very inspiring, especially for school education, not necessarily so for university. It hasn't been implemented in universities. But so providing a sort of, um, how can I say, support and inspiration. So for instance, on digital competence, there is the digital competence framework for citizens that came out in 2013 that details what digital competence means is in terms of uh, knowledge, skills, and attitudes. Okay. And the key competencies are actually knowledge, skills, and attitudes. So uh, Bear in mind what was just been said, and also in Gothenburg was about the social pillar and the reorganization of the workplace. Is Europe skill ready for Industry 4.0? Well, the, the point isn't the big problem in skills provision at, at our level. So I, I agree with you. There's the general level and, and the specialized level. We, of course, we look at the, the specialized level. We don't know what the labor market is going to look like. Nobody knows. So we, do, we, don't, we don't know what we're training for at the moment. Um, which is which is extremely uh, which is extremely let's say interesting. How do you prepare for that? Well, what what you do is you look at what are the skills you think and you're pretty sure are going to be are going to be needed, and they're much broader. So it's about resilience, creativity. It's I mean, if you put it very roughly, it's the things that machines cannot do. So those those are the those are the things, and then there is the whole innovation. I think there are two things. There, there are the labor market going to, to change, so we need a new kind of skill sets for jobs. We don't know what are. So do we need That's to teach people to learn? That, that we always did. And that, that we always did. Are we any good at it, though? I, 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 believe, I believe we're... I would, I would say we're, we're, we're pretty decent. We're pretty decent at it. But I, I think what is also in terms of, of the first question of, of artificial intelligence, what is interesting is... How do we make use of it in the training, in the sense of the entrepreneurs and innovators of tomorrow? How do we train those so that they can use artificial intelligence? And there, you might see a risk in the sense of you say, well, we, we develop artificial intelligence research in Europe and elsewhere. I mean, this you see other, other places in specialized centers. We, this is about having the, the algorithm nerds doing their best. And where I think from what, what we've seen, I personally do a, a, a project on, on innovation in universities, and we look at student startups, that's exactly not what happens. There is, yes, the math or the programmer that meets the biotech recent graduate or student, and they get together and do a startup. That might last, that might not last. And, and when you say when we hit the ground, I think actually on that level, we are hitting the ground at the moment. From, from the little I have seen, there's a lot going on in open innovation. Small companies we don't know of, small companies that are completely under the radar, that are, however, 
extremely vital for innovation in general and serve the bigger ones, often business to business. And, and that's... that's do, you, do you think we're too nerd-focused in this? Do we need more of the humanity side to, to balance the applicable? Oh, just to, to apply, I mean, I, I, I don't think that, that things like artificial intelligence by itself, if it's not applied to anything, is, then it's just a game. Then, then it's, it's uh, intellectually funny. But yes, of course, you can, you can apply it. You can very much apply it to things like, like the humanities, like social science. Even better, you can apply it with all the sites. So have, I can think of examples like citizen science where you have people studying um, urban environments that want to empower citizens so that they, for, for instance, have small, these small measuring instruments so they can go and measure air pollution and you have the, the data management behind that, that you can actually use that for something. And that, again, is usable political in the community. So you have this, these very exciting three, four things put together and empowered by the digital society. Okay. That, that's what's really exciting. Alice, do you confident Europe is going the right direction with uh, its digital society, or do you see gaps in, in the, the skills arena? Um, well, I see... Gaps, yes, I do see. Um, I was actually th more thinking about the question you just asked Thomas. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, because I think it's important to not just ask whether uh, we are ready for Industry 4.0, but also is Industry 4.0 ready for us? Is it ready for society? And I think the answer is no. At how, the do you, moment. how do you mean? Well, in history has shown that with each new technology, you have technology optimists and uh, technology pessimists. And um, you need both. You need the big dreamers and the visionaries, and you also need the nitty gritty uh, realists who ask questions about ethics, about how is this good for society, how is this good for people. And, w f well, my impression is that so far it's mainly the, the big global firms who are starting to think about Industry 4.0 in, in, from their own perspective. But there's little, I think, um, or too little questions that are being asked by, for example, ethicists or from the, the point of view of data privacy or, I mean, are there any NGOs involved in this yet? I'm not sure. So I think we really need both sides and not just start asking the, let's say, the, the regulation, reg regulatory questions or the ethical questions once the technology is already in society. We need to ask them before or while designing. Are, are we politically literate enough at this horizon that we have before us yet? I would say no. I mean, just look at the whole debate around the, the Facebook and Cambridge Analytica um, scandal, I would say. If you look at the way, for example, the um, American Congress has asked questions, um, they're not up to the level of what, what they should ask. Okay. Michael, lifelong learning for members of Congress, perhaps. In terms of <laughs> do you, this is something you really focus on, and for artificial intelligence, lifelong learning, where do you think this is going to go for the for the skills market? What does what does a, a a a young employee need to learn, and where do you think their career is going to go? And what does an older employee need to learn? Where do you see the difference in in, in this divide? I think I think I would would first pick up about whether whether Europe is is ready for um, for Industry 4.0. And, and I would be, I think, a bit more optimistic. I, I would agree with, with Thomas that it's very difficult to know what the labor market will look like in, in 15 years and probably more difficult today than it was 15 years ago, although I'm not 100% sure that's the case. But I would then say if we, if we do what, what universities um, have done so far, maybe with some adjustments, but 
but but have good basic education. And of course, I, I completely agree with, with, with the notion also before that primary and secondary education is strengthened as much as possible. If this uh, requires a coding element, uh, I think that's fine. Um, but, I, but I think a very good bachelor degree in, in computer yeah, science right. will also bring you quite far in the labor market in, in 10, 12 years. Um, and, and I say that just because uh, before I came here today, I, I looked back at the World Economic Forum and they listed some occupations which were not here 15 years ago, uh, which are very pervasive now, and, and one was app developer. Um, and I would claim, had you got a good uh, computer science bachelor degree 15 years ago, you maybe you wouldn't call yourself an app developer, but you were definitely ready to develop apps for for phones. So 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 um, of, uh, so 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 that that's one point I want to make. Even if we don't know where we're going, I mean, strengthening the the basic uh, education element will 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 bring us a long way. And then you 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 come to 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 the interesting aspect of lifelong learning, and of course that's a long. I mean that we talked about lifelong learning 20 years ago uh, as well, and um, I can only say let's let's do everything we we can for for strengthen this area. Uh, the commission is doing doing its bit, and and member states. Uh, for you, what's the most important element of lifelong learning in terms of concept? I, I think it's 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 continuous learning. Mm -hmm. Lifelong learning is not when you when you turn 50, then you start lifelong learning. Lifelong learning starts at, at 25 when you exit university or 20 if you exit uh, some, um, some vocational training. So I think that aspect has to, to be drilled into everybody. And I think everyone, uh, I think at least some people in the room w will look in the mirror to, tonight, or maybe not tonight, but, but someday and say, uh, this lifelong learning, actually, uh, I forgot about that and I haven't done anything for, for the last couple of years. And I think that you have to avoid. This is really a kind of a continuous effort. Just to, before Anuska replies, and then we'll uh, bring Bex and Brando uh, Benefe in, uh, is there something that, you do, do, has our perception of learning changed? So, for example, you, many people criticize university degrees for being out of date before you've even started. And we are so information absorbent today as well, that in a sense we're continually learning. Do we need to be more structured or do we need to be the foxes or the hedgehogs in this instance? I, I think you can always be more structured. Um, if, if we talk about artificial intelligence, I, I don't think, but, but I wouldn't know enough, but my perception would be that good computer science degree is not out of date when you're out of university. That but but that would be nice to hear Thomas <laughs> take on John this. John <laughs> <laughs> And maybe, <laughs> maybe others in the room. <laughs> okay, Anuska. Yes, so I want to build on what uh, sure. Michael was saying. And uh, basically, we're, we were started talking about this before, so we, we, we started the debate uh, bef before the audience came, I think. And uh, um, I, I do agree with you when you say that uh, probably nowadays uh, there is this new job uh, profile as an app developer, uh, whereas 10 years ago there would be like a programmer. But I think that uh, some things have changed, meaning that before I was talking about the fact that digital skills uh, or competencies are white, but they're not just wide in, in terms of basic digital skills. I think they're wide even at a higher level. So, for instance, uh, they do apply and also at a very high level to different professions. So think, for instance, about a medical doctor and uh, the way they could use technology is to do uh, better prognosis for the patients. You know? So I think that there is a degree of digital skills that is quite specialised in a way that covers several aspects and several fields. Think about uh, a lawyer, for instance, and uh, the, the specific and advanced digital skills they would need in their profession. So yes, I do agree with you, but at the same time, I think we need also to move on and think about digital skills as yeah. something that is touching every aspect of our life and also our professions, not just jobs. A lot of my law school graduate colleagues a lot of them actually hate their jobs today because of the level of automation that they've been forced to endure. And law, to my mind, wasn't something that was going to become automated so easily. Uh, Brando, thank you for joining us. Brando Benefe, the Italian uh, Social Democrat MEP. Uh, do you think AI is going to destroy jobs or create jobs? 
<laughs> well, that's a difficult question in the sense that uh, it depends on what we intend for AI and the level of, of development of that. Because we actually already have AI, but what we have today is mostly very far from the kind of imagination of AI that the general public has. So, um, in general, I would say I, I arrived when you were mentioning the issue of the of the of the app developers. I, I, that's the kind of example I always make, in the sense that uh, it's clear that uh, automation, including uh, uh, processes that are governed through AI uh, uh, machine learning uh, 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 paths that we already see uh, uh, being implemented, um, are destroying some kind of jobs. But it's true, for example, if you look at the apps, Okay, it's true that at the time they were programmers, that today they would be called uh, app developers, but it's a fact that there were no apps because there were no uh, 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 smartphones in, uh, in numbers to develop such a market. And it's the numbers of the commission that say that we have uh, almost 2 million jobs uh, in the field of, uh, of apps uh, by the end of last year. And so we have seen a, 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 a set of jobs that, 10 years ago was zero because there were no no apps so uh, my my approach is i would say quite uh, optimistic in the sense that i'm sure that we will find enough ways to navigate through uh, this change to find the right uh, uh, opportunities also for for human uh, uh, employment this means not only in uh, in digital it's mentioned in the presentation of this debate that in fact uh, there are uh, issues regarding uh, uh, economics, uh, psychology, uh, ethical and moral uh, aspects that will need uh, uh, more and more professions also of this kind. And I add, as, a, as the youth uh, 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 intergroup chair in the European Parliament, also uh, the parallel aging society that is uh, being more and more active also at a, at a later age through technology and AI that will anyway need a care uh, 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 industry, we can say, of, of jobs that will be probably only partly digital and will need uh, uh, specific competences, but they will be developed more than today. I, they must be because there will be a totally different uh, demographics also in terms of age uh, uh, distribution of population. Do you, Brando, do you see uh, that the whole economic structure in Europe is changing, or is it just the pace that's changing? Just this? The, the pace, the speed. Uh, no, I think it's not just the pace, for sure. It's also uh, more structural, because we see, exa we see, in fact, some jobs uh, not being there anymore. And also today, in most uh, uh, factories, the, uh, also the factory worker has a level of specialization that is totally different from the kind of, uh, of, uh, of factory worker of a few decades ago. It's totally, totally different. And so uh, uh, it's, uh, uh, it's something that is more structural. I won't, I won't say it's just the pace. It's something that is bigger because also AI poses, uh, as you mentioned it, I would say that's the biggest uh, 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 structural changer because this is something that is new in okay. terms of the impact that it can have on the organization of, of the jobs. Okay, and just before I go to Yasin who wants to, to comment also, the World Economic Forum, it uh, talks about digital transformation and one of the things that highlights is the cost reduction when you're talking about uh, digital, uh, uh, digital elements. For example, um, drones would have cost 100,000 uh, euros 10, 15 years ago. Now you're talking 1,000 euros or less. Uh, is, this, is artificial intelligence, digital, digital economy, becoming more democratic? I'm not sure. When it costs less for someone, there is also someone who is losing somewhere. So I, I'm, I, at least this is how I see it. So I'm a bit prudent about this. I think this is a kind of, of uh, the the person was to sell his product that would would <laughs> take this space. I I would look better at the data before saying that. Okay, very prudent. Yes, sir. 
Um, yeah, I actually wanted to comment on the question of the how the labor market is changing. Sure. But before doing that, I also wanted to make another point that actually digital skills are really important for finding a job, but they're also very important for your personal development. So I think we should not forget this context while what talking about... What do you mean by personal development, though? It's also uh, personal development, I mean... Uh, being active, an active citizen uh, of society and uh, being also politically active and voting because, we, for example, in a country like Bulgaria, you yeah. have the problem that 50% of, of young people are not voting and you, you, you know even um, better what, uh, how it is on the EU level. So I think this is also a way of making people feeling part of society okay. in a much more so I'm, accessible I'm not way. Stop you so Who was it tweeted, Michael or Thomas, somebody tweeted earlier about the, 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 the demographics of uh, online society in Europe between uh, low <laughs> education to high education. Yeah, okay. So if you can find this, to them. Okay. <laughs> might be me. I'll retweet this. You can find it on our, our Twitter feed later. Um, but I find that really interesting because there was quite a stark uh, difference between uh, those who were, uh, had low education, and those who were high education. And it wasn't just an age gap, uh, an age difference as well. Uh, any other observations? That, could you explain why that is? Um. No, I, I just <laughs> didn't know. No, I, I would say, uh, I mean, uh, I, uh, of, of, there is a big gap uh, when it comes to education, but yeah. there was also, this gap was very small when we looked at the very young group, and yes. that was actually the background for saying whether it's, it's still relevant in a, in a bit of a contrarian uh, statement, because it will take, of course, take some time before before 24-year-olds uh, reach 80, so, so it will be relevant That's for some time. That's not going to change, frankly. No. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I entered Yasin, and then we'll go to, yeah, yes, and then we'll go to, to Thomas then. Uh, so, yeah, so talking about the, the labor market, yeah. I, I agree with everyone so far. Indeed, uh, AI is transforming it, but I think also it puts a very special highlight on the human uh, factor. And uh, Anushka mentioned medical doctors, I will mention nurses, for example. So if now a nurse has to go around the hospital bringing different things to, pe to the patients, uh, this can be done by a robot and uh, this nurse can spend time actually with the patients, which is much more valuable, for example. And uh, the, the human factor, no matter how technology develops, will always be there. And uh, one example, I mean, we are talking about the professions of the future, and I believe one of them is actually the teacher profession. It, it will always remain very relevant, and even though things are changing, teachers' uh, teachers' role is very important. And um, uh, another thing is that uh, we should, of course, uh, take care of their lifelong learning as well and, and their upskilling, and this is... Uh, very important for my ministry, but I believe also for or for the Commission and all member states as well. And another, just one last example, uh, I was looking at an article about one of the AI assistants actually, and it's an assistant that makes appointments for you. Yeah. And once uh, the the conversation goes wrong, the, a human intervenes. So <laughs> <laughs> still needed for the moment at least. Thomas van den I want to go back to the, the is there a democratic, can, yeah. can we de democratize things? I think that's a political decision. I would say that the potential for democratization is huge. If I go back to my hobby horse about the startups, yeah. the fact you have, a, you have a, a several things that converge because, okay, you have data power that is bigger. You can transmit and, and work with, with bigger amounts of data. But you also have revolutions in material science and you have 3D printing, which shouldn't be underestimated, which means that if you are a maker, you can go and do your gizmo much more efficiently and cost efficiently than, than you would have 10, 10, 10 years ago. And all these things going together, smaller devices, devices that are cheaper, easier to have, will also mean that you can move things that were before centralized, typically in health. Health is a very good example saying you have big expensive devices and you can only have them out at St. Luke. And now say, well, we actually have smaller, cheaper devices and we can move them into community. We can have much more sustained dialogue within the community with, with, uh, with, 
with the, the people that live there. So the democratic potential is there, just as the big brother potential is there. And the other side is personalization. We often think of personalization for tailor-made clothes, for example, but yeah. this is a, a personalized health care system in a way as well. It, it brings it closer to the, the individual need. Absolutely. I, I, you could go into the, the, the how it changes medical trials in terms of all the extra sure. factors you can put in. Uh, so there's a potential. Niska. Indeed, and building on that, basically, uh, when we think about uh, um, the potential uh, for democracy that uh, digital technologies bring, of course, we need to think about skills or competencies as an enabler. Uh, but, of course, if it's an enabler, it's also a barrier. So I'll, I'll, I'll put it differently. So um, if we think like 20 years ago, uh, the digital divide was mainly because of access. Uh, and nowadays, the digital divide is because of competencies and skills. So you are in or out if you have the competencies and skills to be in or out, if you know what you're doing when you use digital technologies. But on this, I think that in education, so first of all, it, there is a democratic potential, but then education is needed. And, uh, and on this, I think uh, th there are some very interesting examples, on the contrary, on the fact that digital technology can enable different forms of learning. So it's about the practices, it's not just about the devices, it's the way we use our devices. It's not just because we all have a phone in our hands, it's uh, the way that we change our interactions because of this phone in our hands. And for instance, you were talking about making, about uh, uh, robotics, and uh, I think that uh, there are pockets of innovation all around the member state, in Luxembourg, for instance, in Italy, in Portugal, where maker spaces uh, are um, proliferating in, in education, also from primary schools, secondary school. And this is so interesting, not just because of this wave, this hype that there is uh, on digital transformation, but also because there are many teachers that are actually realizing that uh, teaching through tinkering, making, uh, allows uh, learners who are not so academic, but are the good in learning by doing, to, to express their talent and to improve different competencies through uh, the means of digital technologies. Brando and Michael. Well, I agree with these last uh, interventions about the potentials. Uh, I'm also a big uh, supporter of uh, learning uh, on these in school, on the coding in school. We do a lot of that uh, also here in the institutions. Uh, but uh, the reality is that this is far from being democratized at the moment. It's still very far, so it's, yes, we should work on that, but today it's not like that. We have a more emergent, I would say, uh, issue that is uh, the understanding of what is already there and more accessible. So, I mean, um, smartphones, uh, uh, computer, internet, social networks, these are the big numbers uh, of today and they are the ones of concern because to be frank I think we are today in Italy they say people that think that what the television say it's always true and today we have the problem of people that think that what the internet or Facebook say is always true uh, or uh, another social network I mean I may, I, I, I I, in Italy, for example, older people are mostly there. So it's, a, it's a, an issue of understanding how to be not manipulated by, by the, the internet and the technology. And it's still a huge problem before we make uh, the makers uh, on which it's true. I know in Italy it's growing a lot. I've, I've, I go to the fairs and it's growing year by year and I think it's very good. But I think that today, the more for a, a policy maker side, it's important that we make people uh, quickly able to understand what they are dealing with because they are not dealing with, uh, uh, when they see something on the internet, they are not uh, reading the New York Times and they are not uh, uh, totally uh, uh, always aware of that. And that's, that issue is, is it's huge. It's huge in terms of the impact on, the, on democracy and on the way of people understanding how to use technology and not be used by it. Okay, I'll come to us just a moment, Michael. I, I just wanted to, to go back to another concern I could have about the democratization of, of startups, especially in, in, in the field of artificial intelligence, because there you often rely on, on quite large amount of data, mm -hmm. which, which I would think would, if it's amassed somewhere else, would be very difficult to 
to create a startup in it area in that area because you would be behind on the data already and it would be very difficult to 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 get ahead so so that would be uh, one concern i would voice uh, on 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 democratization when when we talk about artificial intelligence okay alice and, and thomas yeah i agree with the previous speaker about uh, there's not just democratic potential but also democratic risk and uh, one of the things is that, for example, we're all now talking about fake news, it's a hot topic, uh, but we've seen nothing yet. This is just the tip of the iceberg. And for example, we're seeing the development uh, of uh, so-called deep fakes, uh, which will make it, it, this is about, let's say, um, for example, videos that can be uh, that can show in the near future, and I've already seen uh, an example, some examples with Barack Obama uh, making statements which he has never done, but they're just manipulated images and sound, and so in the very near future, I think we can see things. When you mention this in terms of, of specific skills, when you say, yes, I was talking about not replacing teachers, this is exactly what I was thinking about, the teachers are going to be replaced, and you can have 25 Barack Obamas in your classroom, <laughs> this is, which may not be a bad thing. Uh, <laughs> we have no political statements to make here. The, <laughs> the idea that, that we, we know where we're going in the future with, uh, w with the jobs of the future as well, is I want to bring us back to this a little bit. What does the profile of the, the the digital employee look like for the next 10 years? I know, I know you said you can't predict this, but you can't predict the jobs. What does the profile in terms of, of education skill sets uh, look like? Quick answers from each one, yes? Sir. I think actually AI enables us to predict a lot and uh, we should use this potential. And just if I may, uh, comment on, on innovation and being creative and uh, also being democratic, actually AI will uh, give us more time because machines will be doing some of the jobs that take now a lot of our time while working. So I believe actually this will enable us to, to think and uh, I think one of the things that we need to um, encourage more in Europe is actually critical thinking. and. Uh, this will be definitely one of the skills of the future needed, but indeed, uh, present yeah. Present as well. <laughs> <laughs> as well, uh, of course. Uh, but uh, data analysis, big data analysis, uh, data scientists, I mean, those are among the, the, okay. the, the jobs for that will be uh, in, in the future there for sure, as well as programming. Okay. Brando, let's talk about, if I can ask you just about Italy as well, whatever you want to comment as well is fine. The, in Italy, how do you see young people preparing? What kind of, what kind of uh, profile do you see for young Italians and how they will be uh, digitally skilled in 10 years? Well, I don't think it's very different from, from the others. I mean, I would more generally say I think it's very important that we so I'm much in line with uh, Mr. Jurov, the uh, question of uh, uh, being apt on uh, uh, and versed on understanding how data works and the value of data in, in their work. Because I think that only recently, due to a series of things, most people, most workers understood that data is a value and then many, many free services were not free. They were paid with data. And so I, I think that this is only a very recent uh, understanding from, of the large part of the workers. And I think this must be a skill for the future digitally savvy worker, understanding what can be done and what you are doing in your work with data and the value it has. And so I, I think this is, okay. this is crucial, absolutely. That's good. Same question, digital profile, 10 years. It's digital and analog at the same time, I think. So I, I do agree, critical uh, thinking, that's fundamental. Uh, creative thinking is not the opposite of critical. You can be critical and creative at the same time. Having thinking skills to core would also be an asset, you know, being uh, you know, able to think in every circumstance, whether you are online, offline working with others, face-to-face -face and remotely, and uh, the most important, common sense. <laughs> That's a niche market. <laughs> Thomas? Yeah, I, I think 
is something would point to, to very entrepreneurial skills. Things like resilience, flexibility, thinking creatively, finding new solutions, because things are going to change all the time. Which for us as an issue is all the things that are exactly the opposite of going to an exam, mm -hmm. which of course is our tool. Um, so, so, and, and this, is, this is what I see happen in universities. I mean, our members are usually pretty clever. And when they all begin to talk <laughs> about project-based and experiential learning in, and student researchers and all these things, it's because they can see that, the, you know, read a book and go to an exam. Yeah. It's not going to So how do you them. measure this? How, how do you quantify the value of the candidate for the uh, job? The value of the candidate, we, our members would usually do that through tracking, but we ask our members, so we actually made very recently a survey uh, where we asked, so what is going on? We do that every couple of years. And what they said, I think it was 94% of the universities, it was a pretty good sample, said, we are reforming learning and teaching because this is where, it's, this is where we need to, to, to change. What are they reforming? They, they're going experiential learning. That's okay. a big yeah. thing, project-based learning. That's, okay. that's, that's a really big thing. And, but but other, there's, a, there's a wave of other things that okay. has to do with lifelong learning, inclusion, things like this. Alice, quick answer. Digital profile, 10 years? Um, I agree with previous speakers on uh, critical thinking and for two things mainly. One is, um, as I previously mentioned, the, 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 the fake news or the, the disinformation development. I think it's hugely important to be able to distinguish between what's real and what's fake. Um, another thing is data privacy. Uh, not just for your personal privacy, but also for the company you're working for, uh, for both privacy and, and security uh, okay. uh, perspective. Michael, and then we're going to go to Q&A, so have your questions ready. The profile that you see for the digital employee 10 years from now? I agree with the skills which were mentioned earlier, and I, I think it's not very different from the skills we're looking for today, to be honest. What's most important on that skill list for you? I guess the critical thinking element would be the most important piece we were looking for. I mean, when we hire in SEPs, we would never look for anyone who, who, uh, who could program a particular language. Of course, we, we're not hiring programmers as such, but we do a quite a lot of statistic and analysis. And if, if the person has uh, uh, good critical thinking skills and a, and a good basic uh, social science education, I would say we can learn that person to, to program what is needed fairly fast. Um, so, so I really, to, to be a bit contrarian here, I, I don't see a, a big change in the skills needed. How you get to them might have to change, and there I agree. Yeah. Okay. Yes, you want to comment? No, yes, I just wanted to add that um, when we look at the key competencies, I mean, one of the uh, most important things is actually how they interact between each other. So when you look at digital skills, it's, it's important also that you have entrepreneurial skills and the skill to learn as well. I mean, it's, re it's really difficult to separate those key competencies. And I think one thing m maybe we forgot to mention is, is actually cybersecurity skills. It's if I'm not uh, mistaken, action number seven in the digital education action plan of the commission. So it's, it's really very important. And uh, I see that the commission as well is raising quite uh, well awareness for that. The Bulgarian commissioner started the safer internet campaign. So yes. this will be, will stay there for some time, I think okay. as well. Thank you. Let's take a couple of questions. Just raise your hand, tell us who you are, where you're from. In the back here, first of all. Hi, I'm Camilla, I'm from CSR Europe, and uh, I wanted to ask you, how do we make sure that uh, um, people are at the center of the next uh, Industry 4.0 revolution? And by people, I just don't mean young people. I mean uh, workers that are 40 or 50s that work in factories and they will see their job probably uh, go to robots or even not them, but even uh, banker workers that will see their job go for blockchain or uh, insurance sector. How do we protect this worker? Do we make universal basic income or do we constrain companies and say, okay, you know, you cannot just fire them, you need to retrain them. How do we do that? Universal basic income for bankers, who's in favor? <laughs> <laughs> 
Who wants to answer? Yes, sir. Uh, well, social security for sure is really important, but also I think here companies should step in and uh, really uh, start upscaling their workers from day one. I think this is... What's the incentive? What's the well, incentive? Well, the incentive is that uh, you cannot wait for the next generation of graduates to come and work for you. You, you need the people right now, so you cannot allow yourself to, to wait. Technology doesn't wait. But sometimes it's easier to tear the building down and rather than have to renovate it on the inside, isn't it? I don't think so. Okay, <laughs> Brando? Yes, I'm more skeptical, to be honest, on the capacity to fully cover this issue by the goodwill of the businesses that uh, <laughs> do their... They want profit. Uh, we are there to govern uh, society and reality and uh, uh, put the norms in place. So, in fact, uh, I think it's uh, from the public policy side that we need to put the right incentives, for sure, that can be of different kinds for the private to step in. But also we need to govern the transition by, I have to say, I arrived when you were talking about that. I think the lifelong learning is crucial, that we put uh, instruments and we sustain with robust uh, policies this. But to be frank, I need to also quote Mr. Juncker that uh, once said that uh, the member states want the EU to solve the, the problem of uh, unemployment and say it's a problem of Europe and then we have 1% of uh, uh, social spending. So. We are waiting, I'm waiting as member of Employment and Social Affairs Committee for the proposal on the ESF Plus of the Commission for the details, apart from the general outline we got on the M future MFF. And I know inside there will be uh, also the part regarding upskilling and digital skills, etc. I think we need to have enough resources to do that. I think that today Europe is facing new challenges and we risk uh, having a very ridiculous haggling between the m member states that are pressed by, by, by uh, elections to choose uh, on where to, to strip uh, off money. I think we n also for this we need to fight, as the European Parliament has said it clearly, for more own resources of the European Union that can give a stronger base instead of this bazaar of the national governments to these uh, uh, long-term policies that only at European level can be planned because the national governments, the regional implementing authorities of many structural funds inside the, government, inside the, the member states are more and more unstable and pressed by uh, uh, huge political pressures for many, many reasons that we all know. And so uh, I think we need more European decision on this. Do you think that the Gothenburg and the Social Pillar put anything in place which is really going to be actionable or does it all depend on, on the, 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 the funding as you just described? On, on this specific issue we are talking today about, upskilling, reskilling, digital skills, uh, lifelong learning, we need the member states totally. In my opinion, at the moment, the pillar of social rights, it's not able to give you anything on that in, without a strong commitment of the member states and or a strong role of the European institutions. It's using its levers to force the member states to take a determinate path, which it might not be electorally rewarding in the short term, but it's needed. And so we need to use the leverage of the European institutions to push towards the, we could say, medium-term interest, which is not always re rewarding for us, elected politicians. So we need the system to incentivize that. Anybody else want to comment on this? Alice? Yeah, and I'm going to bring my phone because I made some notes, because I'm actually currently reading uh, a fascinating book. It's about uh, creating, or creating meaning and about the, the importance of purpose. And they had this great idea, uh, which was actually for schools. Um, so companies are increasingly defining their missions in terms of contributing to society rather than making a profit. And you believe them. <laughs> Sorry. You believe them. Yep. Okay. There, yeah, there, there's. I can def definitely see a trend. Um, so they, the book suggests that every school should have a dream director, someone who sits down with kids to encourage them to think big about the contribution they want to make to society. I think you could do the same for a company. Each company should have a, a dream director sitting down with it, their employees, especially when they're <laughs> going through this transition, <laughs> and, and ask them, 
Like, how would you contribute to society? Yeah. And I think that... And then the finance director will say, and how much do we get back as an no, incentive no, no. to Actually, do that? No, no, actually, the companies that do this, they have their, their uh, employees are more engaged. So they job are more, retention. They, they have higher productivity. They are more uh, inclined to stay with the company. I think there's something in this, actually. The, if you look at Weber's hierarchy of needs, if you provide the basic conditions for creativity, people produce more intellectual property. And if we're struggling to produce basically put bread on the table, the, our capacity to, to be more creative, to, to come up with the intellectual capital needed for the next generation of innovation is, is, more, is more limited. Thomas, do you want to comment on this? Yeah, uh, I just want to, to make a general comment. I mean, they're not only the Commission and the European institutions and the member states in the world. Uh, I think civil they're society <laughs> civil society has a, a role to play here. Uh, I, I take the big lobbying head on and we need university autonomy. I mean, there, there is a role also for sectorial self-regulation here, whether it be uh, institutions like the ones that we represent or, or, or private companies. Mm -hmm. Because otherwise they, they won't take ownership of the agenda. Okay. I mean, that's, 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 that's I think, is, is, is uh, very clear. And if I just can make one point to sure. the, the big companies, whether they, it's bottom line or not bottom line. I think when okay. we deal connected to this with the sustainable development agenda, we actually see big companies as serious actors here. So I, I don't think we should completely distrust big companies, we shouldn't completely trust anybody either, but, but nevertheless, uh, self-regulation within sectors is, is not always a bad thing. Do, don't you think that big companies are the only ones that can really do this? They have the scale and the scope and, and the margins where they can experiment. Brando? I think it would be hypocritical to say no, because I, I, the smaller businesses are not even ready in many countries to host for three months young school, school students to do the uh, exchange between school and work. They are not able to do it. Uh, to do what we are talking about, I cannot even imagine the average small business I know and I deal with daily. So I think we need to consider who can do what. And on universities I, 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 and research centers and, I, and civil society, I totally agree. But again, money is crucial. And that goes back to the budget and to the institutions. Because to be frank, if I look at least at my country, but unfortunately I know that it's not just Italy like that. I came to the European institutions thinking that many bad things were the Italian things, and I found out it's the same in many countries or worse. But in, in Italy, the, uni the universities, this that. was <laughs> giving, me, be, uh, giving me optimism on some issues, but uh, on universities, uh, many Italian universities doing a lot of research, in fact, are operating this research only through the European f funds. Without them, they, they, with the normal fund, they would not do anything that would help. And they can tell you the deans of these universities, not just uh, propaganda. And so it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a fact that today this kind of decision on what to do with the EU money and so the institutions can influence radically what they in this case, the universities also, in terms of research and support for developing of, of uh, technologies and also lifelong learning uh, uh, paths, uh, it it's can be done or not done, in some, at least in some areas e of e our EU union. money leverage is, is 10 times more than national governments going to be able to, to achieve at this level as well. The, e the EU money invested yeah. in education and innovation at this level produces 10 times more than usually than the member states going to do. Yeah, yeah, I think it's, it's good that we keep doing this and increasing the amount of, of, of uh, projects that we finance through the European okay. level uh, decision. I'll just give you sure, go ahead. A, a very quick example of an amazing project that is uh, EU funded, uh, e-twinning for instance, uh, which uh, brings together teachers uh, from different countries and there are uh, 450,000 teachers who are part of e-twinning is the biggest community teacher community in the world. And I think it's one of the best examples of innovation that happened at European level. What does it level. achieve, though? What it has achieved, well, there is a lot of innovation that is happening, as I was saying, in education, but it's happening at uh, uh, pocket level, you know, it's not mainstreamed. Okay. So, of course, it didn't reach uh, the mainstreaming of innovation, but it helped teachers working together. First of all, creating a sense of Europe, in a way. Second, developing digital skills in themselves and in their students. And third, uh, exchanging good practices at several levels. Okay, yes, sir. 
Yeah, I really like the idea Alice mentioned about the dreams director. <laughs> I guess the next step would then be Ministry of Dreams, but since that <laughs> might be a bit far-fetched... I know some people... <laughs> uh, there, there has been another idea actually floating around about Ministry of the Future, and I really like this yeah. one, and I think that especially when, when we talk about the education, we should really focus on the future and not so much deal with the problems that we already have. Those should have been solved actually already, but we should really have the long-term vision. And I know education is probably the least popular sector for politicians to be in, but it, indeed it's really important and hopefully we, we have the right people in it. Another question? Probably our last question actually. Two our hands up. No? John. This is John from Microsoft. <laughs> Can you discuss a little more about the inclusive nature? Because yeah. you know it's great to talk about the university students, but a lot of a lot of our population is not going to go to universities, and and you know in this world of uh, that's changing around them for social cohesion, we need everybody to benefit from the new digital society. Yeah. Yes, Brando. But the, the the European Commission and Parliament, in fact, uh, on the new skills agenda, have put also. Uh, uh, indications on this because, for example, the skills guarantee is exactly for that, for people that didn't even complete the high school to have enough instruments through the structural funds to uh, finance uh, projects to make them literate on a series of issues including digital skills for the, their jobs of the future, even if they didn't complete even hi high school. Obviously, this means that you need the structural funds to be there to fund this, and we see in the negotiations of the MFF. <laughs> yes, Otherwise, it's impossible. So basically, while uh, working on the documents, on the conclusions and recommendations of the presidency, for us it was really important to always talk about all learners, so that everybody is included in this group. And there you have uh, people uh, with uh, special ne ne educational needs, you have people from disadvantaged backgrounds, isolated regions, but also the most talented ones. So it's really important that everybody has access to, to quality education. And I think this is also, this hopefully is reflected in the new Erasmus Plus. Uh, the proposal is uh, quite ambitious uh, money-wise, I think, already, but hopefully also the contact will re reflect this priority as well. And this was also mentioned by all ministers in, in, at the Council last February. Anything else to add? Okay, I love I think, um, talking about inclusiveness, I think the DREAMS director might also help to get more women in STEM. Yes. Because if you ask, like, oh, would you like to be a computer programmer? Well, hmm. But if you ask, like, what would you like to, how would you like to contribute to society, then you can, there's so many ways that you, that, uh, many dreams or ambitions or purposes that you can then together translate to one uh, to a job with digital yeah. skills. And so you mentioned earlier about the, m the marketing changing the name of uh, yeah. Yes, yes, in the, in the pre-debate we had before this, uh, this panel, uh, <laughs> we were talking about the fact that um, there are very few women that take up a career in computer science and uh, there was a change, uh, especially in the last 20 years, there were even less women. Uh, so, uh, for instance, there is, a, there is a problem, of course, there are several problems, let's say. It's not that uh, girls do not have digital skills, of course they do, but they lose their interest very early in life generally between the age of 12 and 15, they lose an interest in STEM education. There was uh, recently a report done by Microsoft actually on this, uh, that, that provides data on this. And um, among the different factors, what we were mentioning before is the fact that there is a lot of uh, negative connotation when we talk about computer science, when you talk about uh, STEM careers that might uh, hold back girls especially, and also women in pursuing a career in computer science and in STEM subjects. So what happened happened, for instance, in, uh, in uh, uh, I think it was in Germany, but also in Italy, is that they started changing their courses and their programs in order to attract more, more girls by including digital media and media and communication as an aspect of a computer science course, for instance. So, uh, but I think this is, I mean, this is a shortcut. 
in a way, but there's much more that needs to be done uh, to enthuse more girls and women in, uh, in taking uh, ICT studies and career. We need, I mean, it's, we are half of the population, you know, so it's, uh, we, we cannot do without, uh, without women, basically. And there is actually at the commission level a lot that has been done. So uh, one of the actions of the Digital Education Action Plan is actually focusing, Action 8 is focusing on, uh, on women, so providing workshop to, to girls especially, and women in uh, uh, taking up uh, ICT uh, computer science and STEMs are subjects at university level. And there's also the initiative of women in digital, for instance, that is quite important, providing role models, but also providing, uh, you know, information and, uh, and um, enthusiasm, let's say, to embrace this as a career. Thank you. A very positive note to almost leave it on. Thomas? <laughs> yeah, I, I think, uh, I think it's, 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 a very valid, it's a very valid point. I mean, there's the point, of course, if you still look at it from the world of universities, that there's about half of a of a cohort go through tertiary education. So there's a lot of people, but there's still a half out there that do other things that are valuable. I think there you go into, first of all, being, being that education institutions, <coughs> universities and others are open, that it's not a closed world. Either you study there or you don't, but there is an engagement with, with communities. And, and the other thing is, is also a recognition that you know, you fall into the trap of speaking of the 50-year-old factory worker as a machine that needs a complete reprogramming. Uh, I think there's, there's, there's really the nuts and bolts of lifelong learning, of recognition of prior learning, recognition of informal and non-formal learning, all these things that are very technical, but also extremely precise and say, well, these people come with something that maybe doesn't need a complete overall but just a little bit extra, and then they can actually contribute a lot or be empowered where they are. Thank you. Let's thank our panelists for uh, we, we close. Uh, Jesen Gero from the Bulgarian Presidency of the Council of the European Union, and Mikhail Barslond, a research fellow at the Center for European Policy Studies. Thank you. Thomas Jorgensen, Senior Policy Coordinator at the European University Association, and Uska Ferrari, Unit uh, for Innovation and EIT at the European Commission. Thank you. Uh, Brando Benefe from the European Parliament, and Alice Mayer also. Thank you all so much. Now, we're going to go upstairs, uh, outside, for our network reception. Let's also thank John Franks, who's and going to Brian come. And McGuire of Iraq for <laughs> hosting this session. <laughs> thank you. And and to our uh, social media team and the camera guys and sign, thank you all very much. And thank you for attending tonight also. We appreciate it very much. Thank, thank you. you.